In the late 1990s, the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program discovered a rare site at the base of Ludlow Mountain. It was attributable to the first Native Americans to enter what we now know as Vermont approximately 12,000 years ago. Archaeologists call these ancient Native Americans Paleo-Indians. The excavations were originally conducted in advance of the Jackson Gore expansion of Okemo Mountain Resort. The site was avoided for several years until 2007 when the resort considered it for the Jackson Gore development. UVM's archaeology program returned at that time to conduct additional excavations and study the site in more detail. We are the only nonprofit educational institution or affiliated group that does this work here in Vermont. Back in time, you know, 11 years ago, which for archaeology is a nanosecond, you know, we measure time in hundreds, if, if not thousands of years. But 11 years ago, we were hired by the Akimo Mountain Resort to survey an area that was proposed for development uh, for their, their then new Jackson Gore um, mountain. And part of that included some base lodge and parking areas and other facilities down sort of at the base of the mountain. Uh, and in the course of that, identified a highly significant Paleo-Indian site on the property, along with other historic resources, uh, including um, colonial era and, and uh, early Euro-American sites associated with a toll road that went, went through the same property. So the area around the, the ski area has been um, inhabited for you know, more than 11,000 years. I don't know that the Paleo-Indians were, were skiing, but they were certainly up there in the, in the mountains at that time. And it was one of those sites that allows us to see how diverse the habitat of these people was during that, during that time, a long, long time ago. We're here at the Jackson Gore uh, development, part of the larger Akimo Mountain Resort. This site number is VTWN289. The VT obviously refers to Vermont. The WN refers to Windsor County. Um, and 289 means that it's the 289th site that's been found in this county. So in um, like Chittenden and Addison counties up north, we have over a thousand site numbers. And in some of the smaller counties, we're still in the hundreds here. We identified um, a, a, a distinctive spear point that archaeologists uh, countrywide recognized as belonging to the Paleo-Indian period. Because of the identification of, of really distinctive raw materials and, and tools, um, we identified this site as archaeologically significant, potentially eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. The Paleo-Indians in general are notable, like I said, for distinctive um, uh, tools. They made a, a particular type of spear point um, that has a central groove running up the middle of both faces. And conversely uh, to what some might think of as the older you are, the more primitive you are, Paleo-Indians are really notable for, for um, at least in stone, being some of the finest stone craftsmen uh, ever to kind of uh, utilize the material. This location being a, a, a one of the few natural east-west corridors through right, the Green Mountains, right. and as such was probably equally a, a corridor for both game and for them moving east and west. There was a number of early homesteads in this area, the original Turnpike Road um, that went through Ludlow in this area was right about through this area. It's actually on Ranta Road, which goes up into the development right now. This, the area that we're standing on, has been plowed, but other than that, it's probably been little changed for the last 11,000 years. You can kind of see behind me, anywhere where it's kind of dark, uh, up at the very top yeah. is where the plow impacted. And in some spots over there, you can even see where the plow wheels kicked in and right here I've got a great example of some plow activity. This is what we call a plow scar yeah. where the soil is dark as the plow dug down into it. Um, the sites were first identified I think back in the middle to late 1990s and um, we studied them again as a condition for the State uh, Department of Historic Preservation to allow us to um, 
further develop these areas. As part of that archaeological uh, work, um, they excavated probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 artifacts. They were required by the state to do an archaeological survey to the point that the state um, was satisfied with the results. And this is a phased approach that happens throughout Vermont under Act 250 or a federal law, like one that applies to federal highways or housing projects, where you go out and you kind of match up the development area where the ground disturbance is going to occur with what we call a predictive model for identifying sites. Is this a likely place that, that would have attracted native habitation at some point in the past? And this location, for example, very level, well-drained soils, above the Black River, kind of on a natural travel corridor, it kind of checked a lot of those boxes for sensitivity uh, under this predictive model. And so that's, that the state then required them to study that area. Sometimes we do work like this and don't find anything. In fact, a majority of the time. Um, and then projects are allowed to move forward without any additional work. In this case, the early work identified sites and our later work identified them as significant, which then the state required you know, a larger sample to be excavated from the site to get that data out of it before it would be destroyed. Um, and then in fact, I think project plans changed and the mountain ended up avoiding impacts to the site area and there are still site deposits preserved there today as a result of the kind of negotiation between the resort and the state of Vermont. Here we are 11 years later, um, I'm now the state archaeologist and um, John and I have uh, worked in the intervening years and actually a little bit before that as well to, to do a lot of research on Paleo-Indians to publish along with our colleague Weatherby Dorshow from the University of New Mexico. A number of papers, book chapters um, about Paleo-Indian sites and how they settled across the landscape, how they moved across the landscape and, and the findings at Jackson Gore really are important in the overall mix of what we've been able to say over the last 11 years. One of the things that's very characteristic of the earliest Paleo Indian um, artifacts is their manufacturing technique and one of the things that changed over time for native people was how they hafted or tied their projectile points or spear points onto a onto an atlatl or a spear throwing dart or later onto an arrow shaft and the point never changed because that was always a necessary part of the weapon weapon system, but what did change was how they tied it on. And, and during their Paleo-Indian period, we have a distinctive, what's called f uh, a fluted point, a channel flake taken off up the, up the center of the artifact to basically thin it so it would fit nicely into a, into a spear shaft dart. And that, that technique and that style was the same whether you're in Washington State, in California, all the way over to the East Coast for this early migration of people into the into what's now North America. And it shows us that those people were connected socially during that time. And so we're digging in a very sandy context there. There are some natural stones, ra mostly rounded pebbles. Um, but some of the materials that native people used are very glassy. They, they work well to make a sharp edge for a stone tool. So those are the materials that really catch the eye of the archaeologist either while excavating or screening. And this is a very tedious process. It takes a really long time because we're being so careful. But these, these things pop right out um, when you know what you're looking for, I guess. And this, was, this piece was found right in place, which is really exciting. And this is one that has this, has this fluted point channel, channel flake going right up the middle of it. Um, kind of doesn't have any of these flake scars that are on the outside. It's been it's been intentionally um, sort of grooved in that way. Just by the diagnostic style of these points, we knew it to be an old site. And, and we saw that right in the field during our last phase of work 11 years ago, uh, uncovering one of these. I think it was the first Paleo-Indian artifact, one of them found in place, in, in the context during an excavation. So it was really, really exciting. And we built on those results. These people were highly mobile, so they didn't leave a lot behind. and so. That's one of, the, one, of the, one of the sort of challenges about this time period in Vermont and across, the, across North America is these sites are really small. They're not a lot preserved because they're so old. 
And so to find them really takes some intensive survey work, which, which is what led to the discovery in this case. A lot of test pits, a lot of test pits that didn't have anything to locate those small areas that did preserve some of this stone tool remains. They're across Vermont. I mean, you have thousands of years of people moving around. The population densities were never that large, but over that much time, you know, particularly those sites that you yourself would look at and say, this is a, this is a great camp spot. I would love to spend the night here. You know, it's well-drained, great view near the water. These folks also had, had interests in, in, um, in traditional, you know, means of, of targeting game routes and things like that. And, you know, that we try to reconstruct, but we, we really don't, you know, certainly don't know everything that they knew. Probably there could have been several groups camping there at the same time, or it could have been successive occupations by the same group. This year we camped here, next year we camp over there, um, and then thousands of years later the archaeologists look at it and it's, it's all roughly the same time period just because of our, our inability to separate out really, really fine-grained periods of time. The field work was done in a couple of weeks and then it was a year or two or more that the, the laboratory work took place looking at each individual artifact after it gets cleaned up, you know, identifying small chips from the making of stone tools to their particular material. Was there any trade material here? And we found some evidence of that potentially as far away as Munsungan Lake in northern Maine materials coming in and also material right from the Champlain Basin up, up in the, um, at the site. So it shows you a little bit about the social networks um, of the people and also their travel um, patterns. You know, and significance is, is balanced with how many other sites we have, how old the site is, what can it tell us, can it fill in gaps in the, in the archeological record? You can see that this is a more typical Paleo-Indian assemblage. And typical is sort of a, uh, used cautiously because Paleo-Indian sites, by their very nature, are extremely rare. But of those in the Northeast, you know, um, sort of large end scrapers, larger side scrapers, typical fluted points, this one made out of local quartzite. These others made from materials in the Hudson Valley. The red is from uh, Monsungan Lake in northern Maine. This yellow is all the way from uh, central Pennsylvania. Getting back to Jackson Gore, what we saw is really, really the same materials by and large, and it appears that they didn't have a lot of access to this important um, glassy stone material, and so they were using every little bit that they could to make sort of flake cutting edges and to make these fluted points, which nevertheless characteristic are quite small. Um, they're using a variety of techniques to try to get the shape with the minimum amount of material available. Um, so it was really interesting in that way, and also its location corresponded to this sort of movement uh, between, you know, a, a corridor between the Connecticut River Valley and the Champlain Basin, suggesting that not only were they likely hunting in this corridor, but they were probably moving from one resource area to another. And we sort of caught them in the midst of this journey where supplies were short. Up in this region, we typically think that the the predominant prey species was caribou. Out in the Great Plains, it was bison, both extinct and modern varieties. Um, but, um, you know, John, you were saying that the Mount Holly Mammoth was found uh, nearby. So there is, there, there um, are remains of a mammoth known from uh, Ludlow, the Mount Holly Mammoth. And although there's no association at all with this site, it is in the region and it's one of the few uh, specimens known in Vermont of this now extinct megafauna. We have evidence from across North America of Paleo-Indians hunting these large animals. At one time it was thought that that was all they did, but now we recognize it was probably pretty rare um, for, for hunters, but they, they clearly were hunting them, and particularly probably towards the end before the mammoths themselves became extinct. There's, there in some areas they became um, smaller, almost pygmy in size, and um, it's possible that they were up there hunting mammoths. It's, it's, it's one of those things that we have to speculate about because we just don't have the preservation. We just don't have the food remains, whereas a site that's only 500 or 1,000 years old, we might find food bone and be able to tell you exactly what they were hunting. Um, in this case, it's so long ago, none of those food remains preserve, and it has to just go on the time and the context 
to figure that out. And, and for that matter, whether they were there in the winter or summer months, obviously a little more challenging to move through there in the winter, particularly at a time where we know that there were likely to be heavy snows, but that may have been the best time to go mammoth hunting when they were slowed down or caribou hunting when you get a, a seasonal migration that may have come through the, the river valley. And we know from research elsewhere did follow migrating game and they had huge rounds of movement over the course of a year that would you know, think nothing of moving around New England from Vermont to the coast of Maine up into the Canadian Maritimes and back would have been easily within a year's round of activity. We know that from the stone tool material that we see and just um, from the context of some of, these, some of these other sites. Part of that movement um, and what we've really been um, looking at in the past decade or so is how the Champlain Sea played into Paleo-Indian lifeways in this region. And for those that aren't aware, about 13,000 years ago, uh, glacial ice melted north of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, a glacial lake that was impounded in uh, the Champlain Basin ran out. And then because the level of the Champlain Valley um, was depressed ice, it was below sea level and seawater ran in. And for the next 3,000 years or so, Champlain Sea was an arm of the Atlantic Ocean. So it contained whales and seals and narwhals and wal walruses. And uh, we spent a good deal of effort and time mapping what the Champlain Sea would have you know, looked like where, how high it went at its maximum. And we've, you know, found a lot of interesting things around that, um, that it was probably not only used as a resource base, it makes a lot of logical sense, but that it was probably also used as a transportation corridor, either using boats to go up around and then to these areas like Northern Maine, rather than going through the greens and the whites and the hill and range country, um, you know, difficult uh, traversing, to use water bodies and potentially watercraft to get to these areas much easily and, and uh, more quickly. Conversely, they could have, like John said, seasonality waited till the winter where likely during this time period in this tundra-like environment, the Champlain Sea froze over. And like uh, natives in, in uh, the Arctic and subarctic, they used winter sea ice to make travel very expedient. So all of that has sort of come about um, in the decades since uh, Jackson Gore was excavated. Archaeology is a really slow science and, and you know, like John, I was just using the examples of Jackson Gore and what we've learned from Paleo-Indian sites like Jackson Gore and do it every time I go out and talk because it's interesting to people. Well, this is a particularly fascinating period of yeah. time, you know, for archaeologists for sure, but we can get excited about most time periods, but this, the, the first people to come into Vermont, how they got there, where they were, and particularly um, as we think about climate change and the changes that Vermont has undergone over, over time, you know, it's, it's really interesting to think about. We know we have a point of time of about 13,000 when there was ice, and so couldn't be here, and so that's helpful. But after that, it's just really a matter of kind of degree and using with the help of geologists to figure out how the ice was receding and, and when people could actually come in. But as soon as they could, you know, we, we, we have, you know, strong evidence that they did. And, you know, we just haven't found all the, all the sites that, that exist out there that may tell us even more about this early, early time period. Sites tend to be located on former Champlain Sea beach margins, which um, a lot of that is in Williston and in Burlington and in um, Shelburne, Charlotte, where um, there's been a lot of development through the 19th century. You know, new techniques like uh, LIDAR um, and, uh, and other real high resolution um, terrain mapping uh, imagery have shown us some really good spots where Paleo-Indian sites might yet be. The fact is that Native America has no written record and archaeology is the only way that we can tell the story of the past for Native people up until the written record begins. So sites like this are extremely valuable for filling in one of those puzzle pieces into the, into the long, you know, um, 12 and a half thousand year old history of, of Natives in Vermont.